Welcome everybody to this, uh, the, uh, um, the fourth in the series of webinars about the FAIR data principles. R, this is the webinar on R for reusable. Here we are. I'll just briefly introduce myself. My name's Keith Russell. I work for the uh, Australian National Data Service. Uh, I'm uh, the host for today and uh, um, a thank you to my colleague Susanna Sabine, who's in the background, um, co-hosting this webinar and organising things in the background. Um, just as a general introduction, uh, the Australian National Data Service works with research organisations from around Australia to establish trusted partnerships, reliable services and um, to add value to research data and enhance the capability in the research sector. Uh, we're working together with two other NCRIS funded projects, Research Data Services, RDS and Nectar, uh, to create an aligned set of joint investments to deliver transformation in the research sector. So this webinar is part of a larger series of uh, ANS activities uh, which aim to support the Australian research community in increasing our ability to manage research data as a national asset. So this is the fourth and final uh, of the four webinars in the series about the FAIR data principles. We've had um, webinars on findable, accessible, interoperable and now we're up to the fourth one, reusable. Um, Please note, this is, this is one that comes up every now and then, um, re, the R stands for reusable, it does not stand for re replicable or reproducible. So reusable is actually broader than those other terms and means that it can be used for more purposes than just purely to replicate or reproduce the, uh, the original research. Today uh, I have, uh, I'll, I'll give a very brief introduction uh, on the what Force 11 says about reusable under the Fair Data Principles, and then I'd like to hand over to Nerida, who will be talking. Nerida from uh, uh, Creative Commons, who will talk about licensing frameworks and choosing a license to make your data more reusable. And uh, after that, Margie Smith from Geoscience Australia will talk about uh, provenance information and not only why it's important, but also how GA have actually uh, approached attaching provenance information to research data. Now, first of all, um, I'll give a just a brief introduction to what Force 11 uh, r agreed on uh, as part of the FAIR data principles under the heading of reusable. So first of all, I'd like to uh, emphasize that to actually make your data reusable, you will also need to incorporate elements under findable, accessible, and interoperable. So if your data is not going to be findable or not going to be accessible, then it will ultimately not be reusable anyway. So this is you, you best to see this as on top of making your data findable, accessible, interoperable. These are extra elements that you need to think about to uh, make it reusable. Um, the way they've um, the way they've talked about it. Well, first of all, there's this first high level heading saying that uh, the data and the metadata should have a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. Well, that's pretty general um, and they then drill down into three specific attributes that are required. Now, the first of those attributes is that the data and the metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. If you make your data available without any license at all, it makes it very hard for a user or a re potential reuser to actually use it because it's just it's completely unclear what what the agreement is, if there's any copyright over the data, if there's any restrictions, things like that. So uh, that's why it's very important to have a license so it's clear what you can do with it. And if you do assign a license, please make sure you use a, a, a standard license, that's def definitely preferred, and uh, ideally in a machine readable format because that way machines can actually uh, interpret whether the data can be used by that machine to do an analysis to pull in the data and um, uh, to actually incorporate it in analyses or whether they need to skip it because it's not licensed for that purpose. And Nerida will talk in much more detail about a possible framework to use uh, to assign a license to your data. The second point they make under, um, under these attributes is that the data and the metadata should be associated with information about the provenance. Now this provides clarity on the steps that were taken in collecting, selecting, analyzing the data. So all the steps that have been taken to turn it from raw data into derived data and into that final data set that is made available as uh, under FAIR uh, through using the FAIR data principles. So this is, for a potential reuser, this is extremely informa useful information because it gives you much more information about the context and the background in, uh, in which the data was created and whether the data will also be suitable for the purposes that the reuser wants to use it for. Attaching provenance information is easier said than done and I'm 
really grateful that Margie's going to be able to talk a little bit more about what, what's happened in practice and how GA has tackled this and how GA is incorporating provenance information. Now the third and final point they make about these relevant attributes is that uh, the data and the metadata should meet domain relevant community standards. Under findable they talked about in more in general about having find a metadata that allows the data to be findable and under interoperable they talked a little bit about the data and using standards. Uh, the point they're making here is that um, uh, it's very useful to make sure that the data and the metadata is in a, or the data is in a data format and a file format that is commonly used in the discipline. So that means another researcher in that same discipline can easily pick it up and use it. And uh, if you use a metadata format, think about using one that is common in the discipline too, so that it contains specific fields that are relevant to that discipline, so that a researcher in that discipline can easily understand more of the detail, what uh, what columns are in that uh, data set, what the uh, context is around the date in which the data was collected, etc. So that makes it much more useful for uh, um, a potential reuser from that community to pick up the data and reuse it. Now, I'd like to first of all hand over to Nerida and Nerida Quatermass from Creative Commons Australia, uh, based at QUT. Um, Nerida, um, I've asked her to present on uh, licensing frameworks and choosing a license to make your data more reusable to give you a bit of a sense what a possible framework is you could use uh, that is a standard framework and that uh, uh, can be made machine readable so that uh, uh, other reusers have a bit much clearer picture about uh, uh, how the data can be used. So uh, I would like to hand over to Nerida. So thanks very much Keith. I think I've just got um, time for a very quick overview of how um, the open licensing framework create, uh, provided by Creative Commons achieves FAIR with regards to reuse rights. Um, the slides will be made available to you and you'll notice that each slide has a link to relevant information and there's a slide at the end of the presentation um, which lists good resources uh, as well. So copyright laws grant the monopoly over a work in material form to the owner of it. Creative Commons licenses have filled a need for a public license, that is one that anybody can rely on as a permission to reuse a work. Before CC licenses, the only way to get reuse rights was by the exceptions allowed in copyright law or through licenses directly negotiated between a copyright owner and a licensee. So the public license, like um, a Creative Commons license, is central to opening up access to research output, including the sharing of data associated with these. I've put an open access spectrum representation on the slide because it's really important to distinguish between free access and reusability which starts with permission to share but extends to the right to make derivative works. These permissions to reuse are communicated with a clear machine readable license. So you probably all know um, a little bit about Creative Commons licenses but as a quick overview um, there are four license elements that can be combined and that results in six licenses. And they're featured on this slide, again, on a spectrum of allowing more to less reuse of a work. Um, the most open or permissive license is known as the attribution or CC BY license and the most restrictive is the attribution non-commercial no derivatives license. Um, you'll see in my slide the free cultural works seal. It's just put there to show you that there are two licenses that qualify for that. But the relevance um, of that seal was that it was developed for the Wikimedia or for Wikimedia and Wikipedia content and it signals an important delineation between less and more restrictive licenses applied to works in the digital commons. So that just um, fills out um, the story um, with that. In addition to the licenses, Creative Commons offers two public domain tools. Now CC0 is the public domain tool 
for creators to use. But there's also a public domain mark which is represented by um, a copyright symbol with a strike through. Um, and that's something that um, is used to um, notify works that are already in the public domain. So that's being used commonly by cultural heritage institutions uh, in their digital collections, for example. But I'm just going to focus on CC0 because it can be particularly important to maximise the reuse of data and databases because it otherwise might be unclear whether highly factual data and databases are restricted by copyright or other rights. So CC0 is intended to cover all copyright and database rights so that however data and databases might be restricted under copyright or otherwise, those rights are all surrendered. Um, so CC0 is foremost a waiver. It means you waive all of your rights so that you have zero rights left in a work, effectively dedicating it uh, to the public domain. It has a legal code beneath it because you need a legal mechanism to relinquish your rights. So when you release content under a CC0 waiver, you're explicitly stating that you do not expect attribution. Now there's a little uncertainty around CC0 because Australian moral rights are fairly new. But the licences have been designed as carefully as possible to respect the author's wishes. So the intent and the general understanding is that you do not need to provide attribution. So probably the main point that I would like to make, and Keith has already referred to this, do license your data. International rules are too variable to rely on the public domain. CC0 ensures maximum compatibility with other licensed works and it prevents attribution stacking. Um, for example, attributing to many uh, in a project or where um, not only do you attribute the immediate source of a derivative work but plus, plus, plus upstream works um, and there are other ways to acknowledge contribution. Um, the next best um, thing is probably the CC BY, the attribution licence, if you really want attribution to be a legal requirement. The licences communicate reuse rights through the three layer design built into the licence. Now the first layer is the legal code, that's the legal instrument which states the terms and conditions of the licence. That second layer is the human readable format. It's the plain language summary that we usually see if we click on the link to a CC license. It's got the relevant icons that clearly indicate the conditions of your licensing and the reuse rights under the license. You might recall the words, you are free to under the following terms. In addition, uh, to supporting reuse by individuals, the FAIR principles put specific emphasis on enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and use the data. And that brings us to the third really important layer of the licence, which is the machine readable translation of the licence, which attaches itself to digital works or digital copies of works. The translation code, which is called rights expression language, becomes embedded in the digital source and that helps search engines and other applications identify a work. Um, I might say this can also be achieved by uploading a work to a content sharing platform that supports CC licensing and takes care of the machine readability for you. It's it's also important to actually mark a work with a licence um, and I'll talk about that shortly. Regarding the robustness of the legal instrument, um, the Creative Commons licences have been upheld in every jurisdiction in which litigation concerning them has, con has occurred. Um, but to date there have been no recorded cases of litigation 
concerning a CC licence in Australia, um, which would tend to support the quality of their construction. I just will make the point that CC licence licences are irrevocable, uh, and so they last for the term of copyright. The licences are also non-exclusive, so it's open to the rights holder to apply another licence to the material should the need arise. That's called dual licensing. Um, so for example, if you release material under a CC BY non-commercial licence, but a commercial partner wishes to exploit the material, you are free to enter into a separate licence with the commercial partner that permits the commercial use. Now to maximise discoverability by search engines and software systems, when you are licensing a work you should make sure to use our licence chooser tool to get the machine readable HTML code. The licence chooser also works um, to mint the licence for the purpose of marking the work itself. There are four important um, things that I'll just point out. Um, with, with regard to the licence chooser and that's that it gives you a framework to select your licence, to provide attribution uh, and citation. And I'll just talk about each of those things a little bit. With regard to licence selection, the licence chooser guides you um, by a series of questions about what reuse you'll allow. So will you allow adaptations of your work to be shared? will you allow commercial uses of your work? And depending upon the answer that you give to that, those questions, the relevant licence or the appropriate licence for you to select will be offered to you and you can see an example there. Um, you do need to remember that if your work is an adaptation of a work licensed under a CC share-alike licence, so there are two of those, then your derivative work must be made available under the same licence as per the share alike condition. With regard to attribution, attribution is a base condition of all of the CC licences. There is flexibility around attribution requirements though, which you'll read in the licence, it says reasonable to means, medium and context. This is really helpful, it enables you to do things like not having attribution um, within a work if it's not reasonable to do so, you can link out to a separate resource that would provide the required um, attribution. It's also flexible in that a licensor can waive some or all of the attribution requirements. The next really important feature of the license chooser is with regards to citation. Um, so being able to locate the work and perhaps also the source works um, that led to that work. Um, and I think that probably answers some of the concerns from data creators about being able to find the original data. Um, there are a few other um, requirements here. If the work you're licensing is a derivative of another work, then you need to communicate that your work is a derivative um, and you need to include the source URL of the original work and you also need to describe the modification that you've made. Now when you're modifying materials under the new version 4 CC licences, you actually have to make a note of any modifications that you make to the materials, regardless of whether the modification is significant enough to merit it being a derivative work and you have to provide um, the URI back to the source. Uh, so again, I think that's um, a good reassurance um, that has been built in. Um, to the license, uh, the version 4 licences. It might be unfeasible to include attribution, I've already referred to that, um, perhaps within a merge data set, um, in which case include a URI back to the unmodified um, version. Um, lastly, um, the license tool allows you or gives, gives you the option to provide a more permissions URL. Um, so for example, if you license something 
CC BY but you're okay with people not attributing you in certain cases, then this is your chance to specify that um, in that resource um, document that you've got. Remember that you can't change the terms of a CC licence but you can always grant additional permissions or warranties beyond what the licence allows. Um, the other thing is that CC licences um, allow for you to incorporate um, elements of third party materials into your works just by marking these and providing attribution to them. So I referred to the need to mark a work um, to convey the license as well and on this slide you can see a number of ways uh, in which to do that uh, and there are some useful source documents there like CC's download page that gives you all of the icons, buttons etc. Regarding content platforms, even if there isn't a license field in a content platform, there's usually a description or some sort of free form field where you can enter uh, information about a work. So uh, that was a very brief overview of um, the Creative Commons license and uh, the, the license chooser framework. Um, and I guess my key message for today is that reuse is a core component of fair data. So you know, do license your data to enable reuse. I think that the Creative Commons licenses provide a simple mechanism to ensure that the users of research have the rights they need to reuse, replicate and apply research outputs and data. Uh, and to disseminate and communicate research output in order to maximise the impact of work while protecting, very importantly, the intellectual property and the academic integrity um, of a work. I think with the built-in attribution and citation which creates a clear path to the original data. Uh, and that's the useful resources link and you'll all um, be able to get your hands on that when the copy is made available. And, and that's it, Keith, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Nerida. That was really interesting. Yeah. And great to see, see not only that the human readable side of things, but the machine readable side of things and the way that that information can be made available to machines. So yeah, thanks, mm. that's good. So now I'd like to hand over to Margie, Margie Smith from Geoscience Australia, um, who will be presenting on uh, how Geoscience Australia has been working on collecting information about provenance of research data and attaching that to the research data. Thank you, thank you, Nerida, for uh, for the uh, uh, the uh, the background on the on, on the CC CC license suite and the different options there, and uh, all the way from CC zero to the most uh, more more restrictive licenses. And uh, I think it's really useful way of seeing uh, how the framework works and how especially you can make it machine readable and attach that. Um, and Margie, thanks for the presentation on, on, on the, attaching that provenance information, how you do that and what that means and uh, especially interested in the, the, f the, the drivers for GA in actually uh, collecting that information and making that, uh, making that available. Finally, in case you're interested in uh, more information about reusable and um, um, first of all there's the, the, the slides, uh, the slides will be made available from, from Narada and from Margie so that they have links to relevant information. Um, there's other, also information on the, on the ANS website, um, we have some information on uh, licensing data for reuse so worth maybe at, uh, going to that uh, link and having a look. So um, just a few resources on reusable, um, so um, uh, there's also if you're interested in the topic of provenance and attaching provenance information to research data. We have an interest group on this topic and uh, you can join that interest group to uh, in, be involved in the discussions and hear what's going on there. Um, finally, if you're interested in um, different types of metadata, uh, metadata that are specific to different disciplines uh, that allow for um, maximum reuse within that discipline, then uh, I would uh, recommend uh, um, following this link and there's links off to a whole series of metadata standards in use across a series of disciplines. Uh, finally, uh, last year we did 23 research data things and one of these research data things is also relevant to the discussion today and that was thing number nine around licensing data for reuse. So uh, if you want to not only learn a bit little more but also have a bit of hands-on experience, uh, I would recommend going to number number thing nine and uh, trying out uh, trying out the, uh, the 
the assignments there. Okay, um, finally, um, as we've now come to the, the end of these, the four webinars on uh, the FAIR data principles, um, just thought I'd give you a bit of an update uh, where we are at. Um, so what will, we be, what will we be doing around FAIR in the coming year? So in the coming year, um, we are interested in to continue work on what it means to make data FAIR. Uh, and that includes sort of collecting and sharing examples of making data FAIR in specific disciplines because there are different ways, different elements and different aspects to making data fair which are relevant in different disciplines. So we'll be working in that space and trying to come up, uh, trying to share some examples uh, and good practices in that space. Um, we'll also continue to engage with data providers, with the research organizations, uh, research facilities and institutions to work on aspects of policy, human and technical infrastructure, but also skills that can be put in place to make it as easy as possible for researchers to make their research data fair. We would like to acknowledge the, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy Program that provides the funding for ANS. Thank you very much.